Hello, I'm Amanda Moore. I'm the director of the Clearing House Community. Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange for November 2016. The Advocacy Exchange is our monthly conversation with advocates advancing change. Both the Clearinghouse Community and the Advocacy Exchange are brought to you by the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, a national leader in advancing justice and opportunity. Today I'm joined by two guests. Um, they're both with us from Washington, D.C., and they both work at Bread for the City in D.C. Um, I'll introduce them in turn. Aja Taylor is the advocacy director there at Bread for the City, and she is a community organizer by training. Hi, Aja. Hi, how are you? Doing okay. I hope you're doing okay, too. <laughs> And we also have with us Taylor Healy. Uh, Taylor is an attorney at Bread for the City and she's the Community Lawyering Project Supervisor. Hi, Taylor. Hi. So Taylor and Aja wrote our most recent Clearinghouse article. It's called Making the Case for Community Lawyering. You can find that article on the Clearinghouse community. That's at povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. We're going to use their article as our starting point for today's conversation about community lawyering and about how lawyers and organizers can work together to create lasting change for their clients. Um, before we get started, though, I want to tell you how you can be part of this conversation. We certainly want to hear from you, and there are a couple of ways that um, you can send us your questions or your comments as we talk. One is, and I see John has also already found this too. Hi, John. Thanks for sending uh, a note. If you're watching in YouTube Live, um, as I think most of you are, you'll see to the right side of the screen a chat box. You can send us questions that way. Um, I've got it pulled up here beside me. That's how Andrea and John have said hello already. So if you have a question or anything, or if you just want to give it a try now, go ahead and send us your name and where you're watching. We'll be glad to hear from you. The other way you can uh, reach us during the conversation is by good old-fashioned email. You can send me an email while we're talking, and uh, I'm monitoring it here. Um, my email address is Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, Everybody who registered for today's conversation will get a follow-up email within the next few days. That email will include a link to a recording of today's conversation and a link to Taylor and Aja's article on community lawyering. Um, so without any further ado, let's get started. Before we get too far into the discussion, though, I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page with our terminology. Taylor, how do you and Aja define community lawyering? What's, what's the working definition that you're using? Sure, we have a pretty dense definition, so I'm going to cheat and read from what we've um, been using. But um, the way we define it is using legal advocacy and organizing to help achieve solutions to community identified issues in ways that develop local leadership and institutions that can continue to exert power to affect systemic change. Um, sort of the key buzzwords there being, you know, we really, uh, we work with communities to try and figure out exactly what issue they're having. And a lot of times it turns out to maybe be a non-legal issue. Um, hence having a lawyer and organizer working together because the solution doesn't always need to be a legal one. Uh, and the other part being developing local leadership and institutions. So community um, solving the issue behind closed doors and then coming back and letting the community know it's solved, but really trying to um, bring the community along with you while you're doing the work and having them be an integral part of developing the strategy so that when the lawyer and the organizer leave, they've left behind an institution and a group of people that can do that work on their own. Great. Well, a lot of lawyers who consider themselves community lawyers work closely with organizers, but unlike the two of you, it's not always in the same organization, um, which I think is a really interesting model. Um, Aja, can you tell us a little more about the structure there at Bread for the City um, and how that came about? Sure, so um, Bread for the City's legal clinic has a community lawyering project um, that actually was started um, a few years before I got there. So I got to Bread in 2012. Um, and it started out with uh, one organ, one lawyer, excuse me, Felisa Carter. Um, and there at Bread, we had a, sort of an advocacy department. Um, and that department had organizers and they used to work together. So Rebecca Lindhurst was a staff attorney at the time um, and had really pushed for 
the community learning project to have um, organizers on staff, have an organizer on staff. And after a few years of pushing for it, um, she was finally granted the opportunity to hire an organizer. And that's when I was hired in 2012. Um, so that had been our structure from 2012 up until a year ago. Um, and that structure still continues in the legal clinic. But what we also did at, at Bread for the City organizationally um, was increase our capacity, increase the number of organizers that we have on staff. So the community learning project has an organizer. So who is, who, uh, was, is my replacement essentially, Aaron Shields. Um, but then also, so I'm the advocacy director and I manage a team of four other organizers. Um, and so all together we work with uh, many departments, but we do really work pretty closely with the community learning projects still, um, especially because our advocacy focus and the community learning projects focus, um, both being housing, uh, housing affordability and uh, neighborhood preservation um, align. So it has just really increased the ability for um, attorneys and organizers to work together. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask the big question here and you can answer this with anecdotes or, or however you want, but Taylor, why do this? It's sort of the, the big question here. Why would a, a, a lawyer or a program that has attorneys and is giving legal, legal representation um, use such a community lawyering model? Why should lawyers and organizers work together? What, what is the benefit of this? Sure. So I think um, naturally lawyers and organizers have the same end goal, which is, you know, lawyers represent individuals or groups of people. Community organizers are also working with groups of people. And the people that we work with, if be it an individual client or a group, um, they, they set out what the goal is. So lawyers are there because they want to help their client achieve whatever their identified goal is. And organizers want the same. Um, I think where people can get hung up is that the, the difference in approaches. So I think even like there's a model legal ethics rule that says, you know, the lawyer is the person in the attorney client relationship that's going to be the one who makes strategy decisions about how the client can achieve that goal. Whereas an organizer um, is there to sort of help guide people, but the community is who has to be making those kinds of decisions because the organizer and the lawyer, you know, are both accountable to the client, but sort of in a different, a different way. Um, I think having that balance, uh, having a lawyer who can bring in technical expertise around certain areas or help inform that strategy, um, because you know maybe an organizer doesn't have that background where, oh, hey, we're deciding between path A or path B, and a lawyer can come in and say, well, I see a lot of issues with path A, but there's also path C that maybe you hadn't thought of before. Um, but not just sort of coming in, imposing you know, your decision and saying, if I were you, this is exactly what I would do coming in, bringing information, um, and then having the organizer sort of take that and work through a different process and a more inclusive process to help people get to get to a decision. So I think it's a really valuable way um, to work as a lawyer. And it also makes you realize um, how often a solution might either, you might not need a legal solution or you might have sort of a, an inside outside strategy where the lawyer is working on one piece um, and the organizer can be doing something else towards the same goal. And I think there's also a, a long-term benefit to this as well that you got out with the initial definition of community lawyering, right? Of course, yes. Having the institution and the group there that you've done the work together, so you've, you've helped build up the power of that community or that group so that, you know, the next time there's an issue, um, you're not having to, to call the lawyer or the organizer. I think one example of that that Aja and I um, brought up in our article was around um, a bus stop that we helped a neighborhood to get. We helped a, a senior building where there was no bus service because it was a brand new building and no one, the city had not brought bus service back to the neighborhood after they built it. Um, I sort of stumbled upon that issue thinking that the tenants were having a problem with food access around, you know, not having income for food, but really it was about lack of transportation to the grocery store. Um, so I contacted Aja because I had no idea what to do about a transportation access issue. I was there thinking people were going to have, you know, landlord tenant problems. Um, but being able to, to work with that community, identify the issue and then help them get that bus stop was great. Um, but Aja took it a step further and said, you know, we've now have three great tenant leaders who we've identified through this bus process. 
Um, I'm going to bring them to a training and Bread for the City is going to pay for it and we're going to take them to Baltimore and we're going to help develop them as organizers. And then, you know, a year later after we helped with that bus stop, when the city tried to take the bus stop service away for the whole neighborhood, not just that group of seniors, um, you know, we heard about it. Aja put in a call to the tenant association and they were the ones who rounded up their neighbors. They were the ones who requested the meeting to have the city come out and be held accountable to them for removing that service. So um, we were able, you know, in that example to sort of see what, yes, working in a community for a short time can achieve, you know, one great outcome. You got a bus stop, but next time it happens, you know, that community was ready to go and really didn't need all of that legwork that we had put in the first time. Well, we have heard from a lot of people, so I want to say um, hello to all of you who've been commenting. Um, we've got people in Pittsburgh and D.C. and Illinois, Ohio, California, so it's great to have all of you here. Thanks. Glad to hear from you. Um, so uh, Amy has asked a question. It was actually my very next question, Amy, so great minds on this wavelength. Um, and Aja, I'll turn this one to you. So, you know, if... Most of the people who are interested in this, like I said, don't have an, an organizer on staff. Mm -hmm. um, so they may be interested in this model, but how do you begin to develop this kind of relationship that you and Taylor have if it's with someone who's from outside your organization? Um, and Amy phrased the question, you know, how can we best identify and find community organizers? They're already working in our service area. So it's mm -hmm. the, the same idea. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so that's a good question, um, Amy. Um, when you don't have folks, so organizers, I found, at least in D.C., and so this may be different where you're from, um, but organizers and the professional legal advocates a lot of times are in some of the same spaces, um, but just don't talk to one another, right? Um, or sometimes talk to one another in a way that's very like collegial, but not necessarily in a way um, where attorneys are like, oh yeah, like we want organizers to be like a part of the strategy. Uh, I think that that has been changing. Um, and so in DC, like finding, um, finding organizers in, you know, depending on your subject area, at community meetings, um, at different um, advocacy meetings that might be going on. Um, Google is great, and I don't say that to be funny, I say that to be honest in that there are folks um, all over the country uh, organizing and doing really beautiful organizing work. Um, but, I mean, they're not going to knock down your door, right? So part of it really is about um, going and seeking them. And then the second part, which is um, sort of the question that you had started to ask, Avanda, which was about, like, how we work together well, um, is Taylor and I have a relationship that's based on mutual respect for what each of us bring to this work. Um, so there, it isn't like, I'm like, oh yeah, organizing is it, you know, people power is it, and you don't need a legal strategy. And at the same time, um, Taylor as an attorney is never like, oh, we just need a legal strategy, and I don't need to um, think about what an organizing strategy would be, right? And we actually tend not to think of them as completely separate, but as part and parcel of one strategy for winning. Um, and what that has done is fostered a relationship where we um, feel free to disagree, so we don't agree about everything, um, but we have a relationship where we can um, disagree, and sometimes vehemently, like sometimes we are like staunchly like on opposite, um, have different approaches to the, to the same issue um, because of our perspectives, right? Or because um, of our like backgrounds or our professional backgrounds. Um, but even those disagreements are rooted in a deep respect for what the other person brings to the work. And so what I found, what I have seen not work um, in situations where organizers and attorneys are working together um, is when organizers are just used for like turnout. So then there are professional advocates and often attorneys who have made uh, lots of decisions about how to move forward. Um, and then they're like, oh, by the way, we need people. We should call someone who works with people um, or we should call someone who's organizing. And not only is that um, just not strategically sound, um, it's disrespectful, right? Because um, for it, it, it feels, I'll say, I can only speak for myself, um, 
that it, it feels to me when that happens to me that it feels to me like oh this is a person who actually doesn't have any idea about the um the um, power of organizing and the power of building power amongst um, people who are receiving services um, and that this person um, like doesn't really want to work with me. They want me to work like for them. Um, and so that that being that orientation, I'll say, um, is a key di is a key difference maker and can be a real barrier. Um, or, you know, on the flip side, when it's done well, can be a real catalyst for a really good working relationship. That's it. Those are some great points, Aja. Um, we've had some questions come in. Let me see. I see we have a few librarians, which I just love. Thanks for joining us, librarians. Um, uh, let's see. Carissa notes that um, <clears throat> they're working with a, a law school to bring legal services to the public through a partnership with the public library that's in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, here's a question from Lisa. Um, in the context of community lawyering, would social workers fulfill the roles of community organizers? Um, that's one question. And the second question that came up um, is where to find the funding to add community organizers to staff? So those are two very different questions. So the first one, I don't know if it's a quick answer or not, about whether social workers can fill the role of organizers. Aja, when it... I think anyone can be an organizer, right? So part of what's really beautiful, and I call Taylor all the time a law organizer, because attorneys, I mean, now Did there you are say some. A, law, a law organizer? <laughs> a law organizer, <laughs> like the Lorax, but not quite a law organizer. Um, just because the way in which she goes out and does her lawyering, like because she like respects organizing and like has taken the time to really learn organizing principles and apply it to her work. It's not necessarily like she's like, oh yeah, and I'm a community organizer, but Taylor has handled projects um, and um, has handled projects or cases um, where she's representing groups of people and has done the work in a way that she would have done it if she were a lawyer and an organizer. I'll say she's done the work of two people um, and has done it well, right? Like has done it well and sometimes like ask my opinion on stuff and like ask me questions, but really has been able to carry it out. So the, the, the quick answer to the question I think is anyone can be an organizer. Now, I don't know like social workers, if there are some things you have to check on about like conflict or like the things that come along with your license, um, like those are things worth considering. I'll say that there are some times that make um, being an attorney difficult for some of the things that you would want to do as an organizer. But yeah, no, certainly, I think that anyone can apply organizing principles to their work and do their work better in a way that is more anti-racist, in a way that um, builds power amongst the people that you're serving. I think anyone can do that. Uh, the second question that Lisa had was about funding um, hmm. and where to find funding to add community organizers to staff. It sounded like in your um, description of how bread for the city had built this. It took time. It sounded like it took several years to to get the resources together to to build this structure. So, how what would yeah. you do to advise? Um, so we have a grant. We have a grant through the DC uh, Bar uh, Foundation that funds basically the community learning project. Um, so there is a dedicated source of funding for that. I'll funds say the, the legal services component of it. So that, that doesn't fund um, our organizer, just to be clear. So, mm. that, yeah. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. So I think that, so the, the grant for the community learning project, getting the funds for the, for the attorney, um, you know, isn't always the hard part. I think Bread for the City, through Aja's position, um, had made the, the commitment that this was something they wanted to try out. And so because we are largely um, privately funded through a lot of our different programs, I don't know, just for some background in Bread for the City, we have a full medical clinic, legal services, social services, a food pantry, and a clothing room. So our funding, um, sometimes, you know, general funds, it can be a little bit flexible. So um, the, the funding for the one organizer sort of came out of that general pot, but then I'll let Aja talk about how for the advocacy department, when we decided to, the organization decided to scale that up and our board made a commitment to, um, a five-year strategy of preserving or, um, helping to create 22,000 units of affordable housing over the next five years. Um, they realized that that was going to take a lot of strategic thinking and organizing. So the advocacy department came out of that commitment. And I'll turn it back to Aja for how you all are sort of funded and grants and stuff. 
Yeah, I mean, so we are still funded through like some general funds and then some um, funds that fund our organizers specifically. What I'll say more broadly is that I think several things. So one, the election happened. And actually, that's not even one. So like one, a lot of the um, executions of black folks have been had been going on um, in the nation. And there's been this national conversation about race, racism and community organizing that I'll say, frankly, has started to push larger foundations. You've seen the Fords do it um, all the way to smaller, um, smaller foundations or foundations with smaller endowments to start reconsidering what it looks like to fund anti-racist work and by extension funding specifically community organizing work um, inside of communities um, and on a more like hyper local scale. So I'll say that in general, there are probably more funds available now than there were five years ago. Um, for this sort of work. I'll also say that too, so the election happened um, and what we saw, well, I'm an organizer and I am biased, <laughs> but my assessment of the political landscape is that what we saw was an inability of the um, Democratic Party, right, to effectively organize people um, and move people to vote. And so we ended up with Donald Trump as a president and um, recognizing a lot of the things that he has been talking about doing in his first hundred days and his years as president, um, people like people on the ground, but then also importantly, foundations are starting to think about what does it mean to do this work? And in fact, in the Chronicle of Philanthropy, um, there was an article that came out either today or yesterday, so you should check it out, by Vu Lee, V-U-L-E-E, -E, um, about this idea that foundations and funders really need to essentially um, forge a social contract, right, with communities and with organizations and figuring out like what it means to be living in this new um, Trump era where um, we're facing mass deportations, where we're facing um, an increasingly militarized police, where we're facing um, the destruction of our environment, when we're facing um, violence against First Nation people, when we're facing all of those things, that building power and active resistance is what we're going to need. And so people or foundations will need to spend their money in ways that both like build physical infrastructure. So like there are a lot of foundations that are turning to figuring out how they can invest like in affordable housing, right? Um, and people infrastructure. So organization, foundations figuring out how they invest in organizations who are working to build social infrastructure that will be able to move an agenda forward um, in this new era. Thank you, Aja. Um, we've had some more questions come in um, that almost feel a little mundane after that great answer. Um, but I do want to get to them because this, it's, you know, in the end it does come down to this practical stuff of how do you, how do you build this? How does it get started? Um, so just I'm picking and choosing. Um, Jackie asks, what is important to include in the planning process of a traditional legal services organization that wants to begin um, to introduce this model? So I guess what are some of the considerations that you would need to have if you were going to try to build the model, uh, something like what you have at Bread for the City? Hmm. I wish my supervisor was here to answer that since she did all that hard work and hired both of us at the same time so we could work together. Um, no, I think like sometimes, um, or a lot of times in legal services, especially if you work at an LSC funded program, um, you know, there's restrictions on, on organizing specifically on like what you can and can't do. Um, and in any that was legal another question that came in as well from Lena. So if you have anything to add on that point, um, yeah. um, the other issue being that, you know, all of us have grant funding where it's tied to, you know, someone has identified a need and you as the lawyer are supposed to serve a hundred clients who have that exact need. And you often find yourself going out into a community and saying like, I'm here to provide 100 survivors of domestic violence with, you know, access to civil protection orders. And that can really limit you in uh, being able to be responsive to what the community needs. And that's, you know, that's very real. I, I started with an Equal Justice Works Fellowship and my, uh, my grant was basically to work in one specific geographic area to run legal services clinics. That actually 
was really, really broad and seemed a little bit overwhelming at first, but being able to have that flexibility of saying I have a geographic focus and my project has a geographic focus made it easier to fund because the, the people were quantifiable. There were X number of people that lived in that neighborhood, X number of people lived out or below the poverty line, you know, things that grant makers are, are interested in knowing. But I left out exactly what, you know, I, I put out, here's all the legal services that we could provide, but I didn't tie myself down to one exact practice area. Uh, so I think that is, you know, perhaps a, a funding strategy to use and to say why that's important because of all the things Audra just said much more eloquently than I'll be able to say around, you know, why organizing is important. It can't, it's, it's, it is hard and it's going to have to be a shift in the funding world that it can't just be about number of people served. It has to be about community change. It has to be about bigger picture things and having our work be able to be responsive to that. So I guess in the meantime, if you can draft grants that are more specific to like a targeted area or a targeted sort of goal in mind of preserving X number of housing units or developing X number of housing units, but having many tools in the toolbox to, to be able to get to that point. Um, I think that's, you know, one thing. As far as LSC restrictions, I, I mean, I'm familiar with what the restrictions are sort of, but I don't know, um, I don't know how you get around, you know, be, are, can you be an organizer? Can you do that? I think certainly, I think you can, uh, you know, have one-to-one -one conversations with, with people um, who are not necessarily like your legal services clients. So you, maybe they're not coming to you in a time of crisis or need, but you're going out to people and saying, hey, you know, I, I do run this legal clinic at this school that's near you or at this office that's near you, um, and I'm here to tell you about those services I have, but I also just kind of want to get to know you and what the needs are in the community, and you might find that, you know, 15 people are having some other issue and um, you could, you know, do what your grant says you have to do, but have enough time to address these other issues or even find out, oh, this whole other issue exists and now I can apply for funding for that whole other issue. The only other thing I would add is that I think it's important. So if our boss was on here, or the story she often told me was about how often that she failed, right? And so it was also like, we have to be honest about like where Bread for the City was five years ago, six, seven, eight years ago when she started asking as an organization that was like committed to like doing all these great things, but did not necessarily buy into the idea of organizing, did not necessarily buy into the idea of spending um, money on advocacy in any way that we were resourcing it substantively in a way that was going to allow us to do it well. Um, and so it also was about, it was about Rebecca being dogged, um, doggedly pushing um, for what it was that she believed was going to make the difference in the project. And it also was about the organization making a commitment um, to transformation, right? So making a commitment to spending money differently. Like it is not by um, accident or by like happenstance um, or luck that we as an organization moved from a place where, you know, Taylor and I were both, um, were both hired, but it wasn't like um, organizing or advocacy at Bread for the City was resourced in any real way to being at a point where it is a department with a, with a, has reached the level of being a core program, right? So it has a director, it has a decision, we have a decision-making power um, and a substantial budget. Um, that is not by happenstance. That is only through pushing and through organizational transformation. Well, I wanted to, you've both mentioned um, your boss is, um, and you may not feel comfortable volunteering your boss uh, for something, but I wonder if, if people um, are interested in this and want to know more about how things came about and what they would need to do to put something similar in place in their organization, could they reach out to her or to you all and then you could be the, the go-between? Um, sure, her cell number is, no, I'm <laughs> Hopefully she's not watching. Yeah, like. yeah no, she can. <laughs> um, we'd be happy to to have to field questions and you know try and um, connect her with those people and maybe we can. She can even send out you know an email with like here's you know whatever information. But um, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. 
Well, that's yeah. great. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, we will send out a follow-up email to everyone who registered. So even the people who aren't, who weren't able to make it live today um, with a link to today's, uh, or the recording of today's conversation and to your article. Um, but we can also put in there and make sure to give them your contact information. So anybody can follow up with you all for more, um, more of the, the nitty gritty practical stuff. Um, amazingly, we have reached the end of our time. Um, we, I, we got to almost everyone's questions. Um, Leota, thank you for your question. It's a big one. I don't know if I could give you a couple minutes to see if we could tackle this one. Um, how do you build trust and healthy, powerful relationships with decision makers if you're a community organizer under a legal services agency that could turn around and sue that decision maker? Is there a way to overcome that? And I think you actually have some examples similar to this in your article about kind of um, working with someone who you might traditionally be perceived as, you know, the enemy um, and building those relationships. Um, yeah, I mean, the example that comes to mind from the article is working with um, a landlord who, uh, you know, maybe wouldn't necessarily be somebody who wanted to have a legal services provider on site. Um, but I was able to, First of all, this is a nonprofit housing provider, so there's already like going to be a little bit of a difference between nonprofit and, and for profit sometimes. But um, the management office there, you know, I went in, I met with them, and said I run a legal clinic next door in the community room, and I'm just letting you know we have all these different services. So leading with, you know, we help people with um, who are having trouble with their SSI benefits, or if they're in a domestic violence situation, or they need help uh, with food stamps or TANF or any of these other things. I'm here for that. Also, I provide, you know, representation in landlord-tenant cases. And I think more I said landlord-tenant questions. I didn't say you're going to see me a lot in court. Um, but, it, I mean, so much of, of organizing or anything is, is who the people are. So at that point in time, there was a manager who was a great person and was very responsive to the needs of tenants and didn't want them to be, you know, having to evict people. So she would try and refer people to me ahead of time. There's another legal services program in D.C., the Legal Council for the Elderly, and they have a similar program where um, before a case gets to court, you know, they try and... Um, work things out ahead of time so you don't have to have people, you know, coming down and having their lives disrupted by going through that eviction court process. So um, in that case, I mean, obviously we were, we always had this sort of, and we could have had an adversarial relationship. Um, the attorney who represented that landlord was more than happy to have me work it out with her client without me. And that might also be unique. I've had it happen more than once, though, where the landlord's attorney says, great, we, are, we were going to sue 20 people, um, or we have sued 20 people at the building, and if you two want to work something out and I don't need to be there, that's fine, and you come up with the agreements. Obviously, the lawyer went through all the agreements before anything was signed, but you know, coming up with some, some terms, that was something that that lawyer was um, you know, totally amenable to. I think it's... I, so the other thing, I'll I'll be honest and say, I think the part that I'm struggling with in the question um, is the idea that there should be like these like powerful transformative relationships with decision makers necessarily. Um, one of the things that I say, so uh, we run an organizer institute, and one of the things that we say is you have no permanent friends and no permanent enemies, right? And, and so that does mean on the no permanent enemy side that there are instances where you will align, where you will see eye to eye. DC is a very small town um, in terms of who works where. So you have people who like used to work alongside you in a coalition and like now they're in the government or now they're a council member or now they're working with a, 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 an agency um, and so, yeah, you know, like that's, yeah, that's your homie. It's like, oh yeah, like when I see you in the street, like, hey, but also um, my obligation, I'm very clear that like my obligation is to the people who I organize with. And like Taylor is very clear that like her obligation is to the people that she represents. And so like, yeah, to the extent that we can use that relationship or lean into that relationship um, in existing relationship to get things done or even like build an, an, uh, a, a good working relationship. Um, Cause that's great. Like when things can happen, what I want to caution people against and what I have seen happen is this idea that like, Oh, well that's, you know, that's our friend from X, Y, Z. And it's like, yeah, well your friend is like saying that, you know, 
children don't get private bathrooms. <laughs> like, so, you know, maybe, like, maybe that's not our friend right now, right? And so really thinking about, I think I would reframe that or reorient that to just thinking about, like, how to build, like, good working relationships with decision makers, sure, but just, like, that I, I actually think that the question is, how do you build the power so that your relationship doesn't necessarily matter, right? So that there are people who have no relationship with decision makers beyond the fact that the decision makers know that these are people who I have to talk to, right? They may not go out, they may not see each other any other time, but they know that if they want to pass legislation about raising taxes on businesses, that they have to contact the Chamber of Commerce, regardless of whether they like each other or not, because the Chamber of Commerce has that level of power. Um, and there are people in the advocacy community who have that level of power. Um, where you can't, you know, do X, Y, Z without consulting, like the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless, for example, um, if you're going to do something about homelessness, regardless of whether you're going to fall be on their side or not. Um, you want to you want to establish the power um, and the pull to make it so that your whether you whether or not you get things done is not actually dependent on a relationship with the decision maker. Well, we really have reached the end of our time, so I'm sorry to those of you who have submitted questions that we didn't get to. We really appreciate them, um, and I will pass those along to Taylor and Aja, um, and maybe they'll be able to follow up in some fashion, maybe through the, the follow-up email that we send. Um, <clears throat> I do want to, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Remind everyone that if you thought today's conversation uh, was interesting, which I certainly did, the article is even better. Um, there are more anecdotes. There are more practice tips um, in Aja and Taylor's article. It's called Making the Case for Community Lawyering, and you can find it at povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. As I said, the follow-up email that you get will also contain um, that link. Um, if you found today's conversation interesting and the article and the topic, you can join our mailing list to be updated about things that come up in the future. That's at povertylaw.org slash join. Um, you can also follow the Shriver Center on LinkedIn. I want to be sure to invite you to next month's Advocacy Exchange. It's our annual Supreme Court recap of the term that ended in June um, and what the justices said about access to the federal courts during that term. I'll be joined by Mona Tawatau of the Western Center on Law and Poverty, Gary Smith of Legal Services of Northern California, Jane Perkins of the National Health Law Program, and Gil DeFord of the Center <coughs> for Medicare Advocacy. That will take place on Wednesday, December 14th at uh, the same time as today, 1 o'clock Eastern and 10 o'clock Pacific. Um, there will be a uh, link to register for that that will also be in that follow-up email, so keep your um, eye open for that in your inbox. I hope you'll be able to join us then. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank Taylor and Aja again for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Um, and thank all of you for tuning in. Um, until next month, remember that especially now more than ever, you are not alone out there. Thanks. <laughs>